Well, let's take our Bibles. We'll go back to the book of Psalm, uh, book of Psalms, Psalm 72, Psalm 72. And I need to speak very briefly tonight because we have the Lord's table, and I don't want us to be very long before we get to that. But we are going to begin our series of messages that we're going to be speaking on on, on Sunday evenings, the, Lord Day, the Lord's Day evenings from now on through uh, the rest of the summer and into early fall. And we're going to be looking at the different uh, moral issues that we're faced with today uh, that are right there in our face. And we have to uh, learn from God's word how to respond to these moral issues. Now, before we go any further, though we're speaking about moral issues, we have to be careful that we do not try to make the lost world around us moral. Okay, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about responding to these moral issues. We're talking about how do Christians respond to moral issues. But the lost world does not need to be told how to be more moral. The lost world cannot be moral. The lost world needs the saving news of Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. And they need to recognize that they are by birth and by choice, sinners and separated from a thrice holy God because of that sin. And they need simply to come by faith to Christ Jesus. That's the message that the world needs to hear. But the Christian does need to understand what the Bible teaches about these moral issues so that we can learn how to respond to them uh, so that we're not shaken by them and so that we can Speak the truth in love as it is, as the opportunity is presented. And so we're going to talk about ancient answers for modern day issues. And we're going to discover really that the issues of today are not that modern. They're just being, they're just on a loop cycle. They're just being replayed uh, from generation to generation. But the Bible has an answer for every issue that we're facing today. And it will continue to have the answer for generations to come. So we're going to look at moral issues, and we're going to begin this evening by looking at this subject, who has the authority? By whose authority? Whose authority are we going to stand on when we study these things of morality? Is it the church's uh, authority? Is it a denominational authority? Is it, an, is it an individual's authority? By whose authority are we going to study these subjects out and come to the truth about them? Well, I'll give you the authority and then we'll look at it and we'll confirm that through the scripture. It's Jesus who has the moral authority. Jesus is the moral authority. We are witnesses to his moral authority and we are to submit ourselves to his moral authority. So when we talk about who has the moral authority, we're not talking about the Baptist church. We're not talking about a particular denomination. We're not talking about a, a hierarchy of, uh, of Christians that are uh, locked away somewhere in an office dictating to the church as a whole what we should believe or what we should do. No, it's Jesus Christ who only has the right to say, I am the moral authority. And so we're going to look at that tonight. And this really is a foundational message because we cannot truly stand on any other belief when it comes to these areas of morality until we first of all stand upon and be built upon the one true foundation, Jesus Christ. Opinion changes. 30 years ago, what was unacceptable is acceptable today. Um, culture changes. Ideals change. Sometimes society is very wicked. I mentioned this morning Nero. He was a very wicked ruler. More wicked than what we see going on in our rulers today. If you don't, believe, if you don't agree with me on that, study the life of Nero. I won't mention some of the things that I have read Nero was guilty of. I, I, I was cautious not to mention too many of those things this morning. In an adult setting, I surely won't mention it when there's children around. He, is so, he was so vilely wicked. He wasn't the only one. Caligula was even more wicked than him. And it just, there was a whole line of uh, people leading Rome 
who led Rome into debauchery and wickedness. The wickedness was from the top down. Uh, we don't live in days like that. Oh, we live in wicked days, and we live in days that are leading to more and more wickedness. But we live in a world that goes through cycles. There will be a moralistic uprising, and then there will be a moral downfall. And, and wickedness will be on, on, the, uh, on the rise. And that's how the world turns. And so if we leave it up to a denomination to tell us what, what morality we should have, if we leave it up to an individual uh, what morals we should hold to, we will be enslaved to the morality, hear me now, of their day or their particular brand of Christianity or their particular viewpoints. That's dangerous. It's dangerous to start building your beliefs on what another person's opinion is. Equally dangerous is building your beliefs on what your opinions are or my opinions are. So it's best and right and the only safest thing that we can do is go to the one who is the moral authority and glean from him all that we need to glean and we can in 2022 do that. Why? Because after all these thousands of years, our moral authority hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. And so we're going to talk about by whose authority? Well, not mine, not my opinions. I'm going to work very hard not to give you my opinions on these things as we study them. But I'm going to work very hard equally to give you our moral authority's opinion, Jesus Christ. So let's pray. You be a friend to me and pray for me and pray with me, and then we'll look at this subject. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your love. We thank you that you are unchanging. We thank you that your word is never diminished, that your wisdom is never out of touch with our modern day, and that uh, you have for us all that we need for faith and practice, uh, for life and godliness. And so I pray, God, that you'd help us to look to you as our one and only moral authority. Lord, this really is the, this is the thing that will either make us true Bible-believing Christians or make us just Christian in name only. If we look to you as the moral authority or if we choose to play games uh, with what you have said, Lord, help us to be faithful and true to you as you have been faithful and true to us. We love you now and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This will be a bit of a teaching message, and we will look at different scriptures of pas uh, in uh, different passages of scripture. So I would encourage you to jot them down or turn to them quickly. First of all, tonight, let's talk about this. What do many people in our world, even within our Christian circles, accept as moral authority? Well, they accept, we accept a great many things, and I'm guilty of this, this too. We accept feelings as moral authority, don't we? If it feels good, do it. That's what we've, that's been ingrained in us. And that's why we take our last $5 out of our pocket and we go to the gas station and uh, we go in and buy a slushie or we buy a soda. Now we could go buy a whole case of soda. What do you call it here, pop or soda? Pop. You could go and buy a whole case of soda <laughs> at the store or pop. Uh, you could do that for five bucks, but you don't. Because your flesh sees it and you say, oh, I feel like I want it. So even though this is my last five bucks until payday, I'll squander it, you know, on this big gulp. This 45 ounces of pure sugar. Uh, forget the diet stuff. I'm, I'm spending my last five bucks. I want the, the pure stuff. And you get the full sugar. And you, you, you can't go to sleep the rest of the night. And, you know, all this kind of thing. We react constantly to how we feel our body tells us uh, what to do and we give in so easily. Our, our feelings tell us what to do and we give in so easily. Our emotions twist and turn and we just succumb so easily because it has been ingrained in us that if it feels right, then it must be right. Now, what's the opposite of that? If it doesn't feel good, then it must be wrong. And here's the problem with that. Much of what is good and healthy for us, both physically and spiritually, does not appeal to the flesh vegetables don't appeal, appeal to my flesh. <laughs> Fried chicken appeals to my flesh. Amen. But vegetables keep me living. And fried chicken is going to give me an early death, isn't it? 
you understand. Same with our emotions, same with our feelings. Listen to these verses. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It feels right, but the end of it is death. Proverbs 28, verse 26 says that if we trust our own heart, our own emotions, our own feelings, it says this quite literally, we are acting the fool. Now God gave us emotions. And we praise him for doing it. Otherwise, we'd just be robots. We'd just kind of clamor about and not have any real emotional connection with anything or anyone. God gave us emotions because he is an emotional being. He loves. He hates. He feels. He can be delighted and he can be upset. Yes. We are made in the image of him. And so it is reasonable to understand we have emotions only because he has given us emotions and he has emotions. So there's nothing wrong with emotions. But there's something wrong about being led and basing what we believe on our emotions. Take, take your Bible here and go to Jeremiah chapter 10 if you would. Jeremiah there in the Old Testament. Very interesting verse here in Jeremiah chapter 10. And notice verse 23. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Boy, this is counterculture, isn't it? This goes against our flesh, isn't it? I know the way I should go. I know what's right and wrong. I know what uh, is good and what's not good. That's what we think. Because we've been educated. Because we know how to read. Because we know how to write. Because we know how to add. Because we know how to subtract. We, we've gone through school. And so we come to a place of physical maturity and mental maturity. And we say, I know the, what, the, the, the up from the down and the right from the left and the, 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 the bright from the dark. But according to the Lord's words here, written by Jeremiah, a man much more godlier than me, and probably you, he says, I know that my steps should not be directed by me because my feelings are easily, easily manipulated. Many people have been destroyed in life because they have followed their heart. When it comes to the area of morals, many other areas, but we're talking about morality, and they have judged what is moral and what is immoral, what is right and what is wrong, and they have then participated in things that they have classified as moral because their feelings have said that it was moral when God has called it immoral. Feelings should not be our moral authority. Feelings are easily manipulated. A lot of people then say, well, I won't follow my feelings, but I'll follow my conscience. After all, the conscience is the barometer that God gives us to tell us. If we're doing right, we're doing wrong. Everybody has a conscience. Unsaved people, saved people. We're born with a conscience. The problem with the conscience is that it is not always reliable. It can be like a clock. It can be manipulated. If yeah, there's a clock back here. I have a watch on my wrist. What good is a clock? What good is a watch if somebody has fiddled with it? It might still have a battery in it that's working. It might still be able to tell the time. But it's not telling the accurate time. Right? This is the idea of the conscience. It can be seared. The Bible says the conscience can be seared. It can be, it can be quieted. In fact... Normally, let's face the facts, by the time we're preteen, we have learned how to desensitize the conscience. We do that because we do not like being told that what we are doing is wrong. And so we quiet it, and it's very easily quieted. Very easily, it will just kind of fade into the background. Paul talks about the time before he was saved. 
as he was persecuting Christians. You know what he says? He said, I've had a clean conscience. He said, I had a clean conscience when I was doing it. Because I thought I was doing, yes, I, I recognized it was not a, a fun thing. It wasn't a pleasant thing, the persecution of these believers. But I thought I was serving God by persecuting these blasphemers. His conscience didn't stop him from standing over the crowd that stoned Stephen. No one stopped and said, wait a minute. We're killing this guy for the words that he said? We're going to stone this man to death because we just don't like the religion he follows? Nobody had the sense? Where was the conscience? I'll tell you what, when a crowd, when a mob is walking down the street, there's no conscience. There's no conscience. And that's why mob mentality is always the wrong mentality. When you find yourself in a mob and they're about to storm the castle, they might be storming the castle for the right reasons. But you're going to find a lot of horrible things taking place because the conscience, there's no collective conscience. There's no such thing as a collective conscience. Conscience is an individual thing. We must be careful about searing our conscience and just building our beliefs when it comes to things of morality on our conscience. Don't turn there, but later on in your own personal studies, you can read a passage that I referenced there in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, where Paul talks about the fact that he did what he did as an unregenerated person, destroying people for, uh, because they were Christians, and he did it with a clean conscience. What is he saying? My conscience was not a good moral authority. Here's another one. Culture and peer pressure. Really? Same thing. Culture is peer pressure and peer pressure is culture. Okay. Peer pressure is only culture being vocal. That's all peer pressure is. It's culture being vocal. This is the idea that everyone is doing it. It can't be that bad. Or the idea of, well, you know, I don't know if I really believe that. I, I kind of think that that's unhealthy. Maybe it's wrong, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want to be an outcast. So I'll just go along with that. Now, here's the problem with that. We might have an objection to something, but not ever speak out about it, not really define our, our, our understanding of that thing being immoral because we're afraid of culture kind of coming down on us and beating us up. And we know that they will because we see that happen all the time. Uh, and we'll be fine. We're, you know, we'll say, okay, homosexuality is immoral. It's wrong. God says it. I'm not going to do that. Okay, fine. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not going to separate from it. I'm not going to stop watching uh, entertainers that are promoting it. I'm not going to stop reading uh, uh, big shot preachers who are writing books saying it's okay. Uh, I'm not going to call out uh, Christians that are claiming to be involved in that lifestyle and still you know, holding the cross with one hand and, and holding the rainbow flag with that. I'm, I'm not going to call that out. Okay. Now you might never be swayed to that position. But your little ones will be. My little ones will be. Because if no one's going to sit them down and teach them and do the hard thing and, and, and say, this is what God said, and I'm sorry if your friend is that way, and I'm sorry if your school is telling you that, but this is what our moral authority has said, and that teacher, she might be kind, she might be good, but she's not the moral authority. And that friend, love him, encourage him, lead him to Christ if you get, but he's not your moral authority. Go with me to Matthew, if you, if you have an opportunity to do that. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Notice verse 13. Jesus says this, Enter ye into the straight gate. That's a, that's a very narrow thing. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. 
and few there be that find it. Hear me, church. When we agree that Christ is our moral authority, and then secondly, agree that we're going to submit to his moral authority, we're entering into the straight gate. And it is a despised thing. Wide is the gate that culture is going through. Wide is the gate that society is going through. There's no shortage of people that are running away from the, the, the loving Savior head first towards hell. There is not a shortage of, of that. But there's just a narrow single file filing through the straight gate. What's Jesus saying? He's saying just because the, the majority says it's okay doesn't mean it's okay. Culture and peer pressure because everybody's doing it and nobody's suffering from it is not legitimate moral authority. Those who succumb to that thinking are like those in the days of Noah who with the majority mocked Noah. But when the door was shut and the water began to flow up, ever thought about that? said so the, 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 the water broke forth. I was watching a documentary with little Jack when my wife was out of town. We occupied our evenings by watching documentaries. <laughs> and uh, we were watching a documentary about Texas. Do you know that there's a great, that three-fourths of Texas is, is on top of great bodies of water? Did you know that? I didn't know that. That's where they get their water. They don't get it from the rain or anything. They get it from the ground. They pump it up. There are blind creatures down there. I couldn't believe. I fell asleep and woke up and Jack was watching this thing about bl blind catfish. It gave me night. It's a thing of nightmares. It's the thing of nightmares to see this blind catfish. But they're down there under the ground. Imagine in Noah's day, thousands of liters of water flowing up. The heavens opening up and the water flowing down. They started banging on the door. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. Think of those in Joshua's day. They would have, uh, a great many of them did not want to claim Canaan land and they perished in the wilderness. We must be careful about being easily persuaded by the majority, by culture. Here's one last one before we leave this point. What is not an acceptable moral authority? Religious leaders. I don't know if I'm religious and I don't know if I'm a leader, but I'm a pastor, so I'm kind of putting myself in that, that position. The preacher said I could do it, or the preacher said I shouldn't do it. Wait a minute. When did we start building doctrine on what the preacher said? When did we start finding out what, uh, uh, building, building what we believe on what the preacher said? And when did the preacher start usurping the authority of God's word? There's something wrong with a church, whether it be Baptist or any other church, where the preacher doesn't have to open the word of God. He can just say whatever he wants to say and give a talk, and give a lecture. Listen, call it a lecture then. But we're supposed to preach the word of God. Be, preach the word. That's what the Bible tells me to do. And I've sometimes failed at it. And sometimes I've had to go back and correct statements I've made because I haven't always... Uh, I'm flesh. But the preacher is supposed to preach that. Amen. Not this. Not this. That. That's what the preacher is supposed to preach. And too many religious leaders have tried to take the authority that only belongs to Jesus. The moral authority. And here's what happens. In a conservative church, what they start doing is saying, Well, if the dress isn't that long. Well, if the hair is not that short. Well, if this or if that, and you become, and there's this rigid, very narrow view. If the preacher doesn't like golf, he's going to preach about how golf is a sin. You say, oh, preachers don't do that. I sat under a preacher who preached that. I don't sit under him anymore. <laughs> In a liberal church, it goes in opposite direction. Well, the preacher's, you know, he's drinking whiskey in his office. 
He's smoking a big stogie. He's got a big cigar down there. I mean, after all, Spurgeon smoked. Yeah, before cancer was understood to exist. Yeah, he did. You follow what I'm saying? Amen. Times change. We now know smoking is detrimental to the body. Amen. That's why we should abstain from it. Uh, you're not going to go to hell if you smoke. But you might go to heaven quicker. <laughs> okay, we don't want you to go there that quick. Catch what I'm saying? Do you understand, though? If we let say, well, Spurgeon did this, or Moody did this. Moody was also like 400 pounds. You know, should we, should we, should we, is that what you want? Should I go and just feast? Should I have you bringing me food all the time and just be like a gor gorge myself? You say, no, of course not, Pastor Rich. We understand that eating healthy and being, you know, somewhat tr trim, that's, so you can do your job. Times change. Preachers change. The style of preaching changes. But the moral authority of Jesus never changes. You're in Matthew chapter 7. Look at the next, uh, look at verse 15, the next verse. Beware of false prophets. A prophet was a proclaimer of God's word. A preacher is a proclaimer of God's word. Beware of false preachers. What are they doing? They're preaching. They're, they're trying to usurp the authority of Jesus. And they're preaching falsehood. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Or in other words, don't believe everything that sounds religious. But try the spirits. Test them, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone into the world. Many. These things are not legitimate moral authority. So let's look at, secondly, Christ's moral authority. Christ's moral authority. For the Christian, Christ is the only moral authority we have. Think of our text passage. He shall have dominion. What does dominion mean? Why did we use that as our text passage? Dominion means authority. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. Now, we like to think of that in Canada from one ocean to the next. And it should mean that, yes, for us. But it doesn't mean that. It means from sea back to sea. He has more authority on this earth, and he alone. In Matthew 28, verse 18, the great commission passage, we, we read, All power is given unto me. All authority is given unto me. Look at Acts chapter 17. What is Jesus going to do with this moral authority of his? Well, for now, he is guiding his church through his moral authority, or by his moral authority. But here in Acts chapter 17, we see that one day he's going to judge all mankind based on his moral authority, not our moral authority. And this is why it's so important to get this down. Jesus is the moral authority because he's going to judge us based on his moral authority. If our, if our opinions don't line up with him, he's not going to take that into consideration, you see. You stand before a judge and say, well, you know, I, I was going 120 in a 30 zone. But judge, I feel like it was safe. I'm a really good driver. Hey, I am. I am. The judge is not going to take your feelings into consideration. He's not going to say, well, I see you've got no tickets. I see you've been in no accidents. So, I'll give it to you this time. Jesus isn't going to do that. Jesus doesn't really care very much about what we, what our opinions are. He's going to judge us, though, according to his moral authority and that standard. And that's what is written here in Acts chapter 17. Uh, look at verse 30. And the times of the ignorance God winked at, or he, he overlooked our ignorance is what that's saying because you, you would not chastise a child for doing something out of ignorance, right? And God will not chastise or punish those who are behaving out of ignorance. But we don't behave out of ignorance anymore. We have the light, see, that has revealed sin to us. 
and the times the, uh, of this ignorance God winked at. But now commendeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day. God has a day timer. He has a calendar. He has something somewhere where he has appointed a day. Where he has appointed a day, uh, excuse me, in which he, he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus is our moral authority, and he is going to judge all mankind by himself. So you, we need to be in line with him. We need to be in harmony with him. Don't turn there for sake of time, but jot it down. In John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus tells us that he's going to judge us in righteousness according to his word. He says that his word is going to be the standard. It's the law book. It is what is the definitive judgment. Now, you say, but Jesus... Um, he only gave us the Gospels. So that means if he's our moral standard, he's our moral authority, then we should only focus on the four Gospels and from his life and from what he displayed for us in the four Gospels, that's what we should take and we should take nothing else because after all, God, Jesus is our moral authority. Here's the problem with that. Jesus delegated to his apostles, his authority. Now, to be an apostle, one had to meet certain criteria. The apostle, the office of the apostle, from what I believe in scripture, I believe it teaches pretty clearly, was not something that was passed down. We don't have apostles today. I don't call myself Apostle Richie. Uh, I, don't, I don't do that. Why? Because we don't have apostles today. The apostolic office ended with the last apostle. Because they were the only ones that met certain criteria. They had to be in the presence of the risen Lord. They had to be commissioned by him and sent by him as an apostle. The word apostle means... Did a microphone just come on? <laughs> I feel like something all of a sudden just got flipped. Uh, the word apostle itself means one who is sent to represent disciple, learner. When Jesus was on earth, they were, his, they were learners. Before he left earth to go back to heaven, he commissioned them to go out and be apostles. And he also gave them special sign gifts to authenticate what they were teaching. Raising from the dead, healing, various miracles of various kinds. Okay. Why was that important? Why was that needed? It was important and needed because the scripture wasn't completed. The script, who, who was going to give us the rest of the scriptures? Could you imagine the New Testament ending with the book of John, the Gospel of John? All the treasures of God's mind that we would have missed out on. So Jesus assigned or delegated authority to the apostles and then gave them what he wanted them to write under inspiration. And they wrote what we call the epistles. What do we get from the epistles? We get doctrine. We get church structure. We get moral teaching. We get those three things. If you only study the four Gospels, you don't know anything about the church. You won't know how it's supposed to be structured. You only study the Gospels, you're not going to have much teaching on morality unless you fall into the Pharisee camp, because Jesus did hit that pretty hard. I hope you're not in that camp. They were self-righteous, those people. If you only study the four Gospels, you're going to miss out on very, very much of what God wanted us to know because he gave it to us through the apostles. So, when we read the books that were written by the apostles, when we accept the apostles' doctrine, we are in fact accepting Christ's doctrine because they represented Christ. They were the only ones commissioned to truly represent him here on earth. So as we study the whole Bible, and especially these epistles that we have here in the New Testament, 
that's what we get. We get church structure. How should the church be built? How should it operate? How should it be led, et cetera, et cetera. And we get a lot of doctrine, and we get a lot of teaching on morality. Think of the teaching we get on morality throughout the uh, writings of the apostles. We, we are warned about our talk. We're warned about our walk. We're warned about our thinking. We're warned about sexual immorality in the church. We're warned about um, sowing seeds of discord or uh, living chaotically and living with malice and all these types of different ideas. These are all moral issues. Jewish morality wasn't enough for the New Testament church. God didn't want us to be governed as a New Testament church with the Old Testament law. That never was his intent. So he gave us the apostles, and by inspiration, to be breathed, God breathed, he led them, according to the apostle, to the apostle Peter, as holy men were moved to record, to write down what God wanted us to know. The apostles' doctrine is the Christian standard of moral authority because it is Christ's word. Now, in closing, Christians need, to be, uh, uh, Christians need not be confused by the various ide uh, moral issues that are facing us today. We don't need to be confused. We don't need to be shaken by them. We don't need to be scared. But what we do need to do is look to our moral authority, get that set in our mind. I'm not going to just take Pastor Rich's word for it. I'm not just going to take the Baptist church's word for it. I'm going to look to my moral authority. And I'm a friend to all who will look to that same moral authority, and I'm an enemy to those who oppose that moral authority in a, in a spiritual sense. And I'm going to look to my moral authority, Jesus Christ, and Him alone, and from Him alone, I'm going to know what I believe about these things. And I'm not going to be persuaded, and I'm not going to be moved from these positions, no matter how many amount of time goes by, because my moral authority doesn't change. Ephesians 4.21 says the truth is in Christ. Not just that Jesus is truth, but that the truth is in him. The closer we are to him, the closer we are to truth. Let's end with one passage here. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. It gives us a beautiful promise. It really does. 2 Peter chapter 1, let's read verse 2 for context, and our main idea comes from verse 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through, knowledge of, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. In other words, we could say it like this. He has given us all the morality we need and all the moral instruction we need for life and for godliness. But don't neglect the last part of the verse. For glory and virtue. When we walk close to our moral authority, he gives us the power to be moral. And when we live morally pleasing lives to him and for his glory, he pours out his glory upon us and he makes us virtuous people. Virtuous people. If you're looking for truth as it pertains to morality and moral issues of our day, then the only thing to do is to look to Jesus and his word. For he is our guide and authority in all things in faith and in practice. So Jesus is our moral authority. That's lesson number one. We'll start to get into the more specific subjects in the weeks to come. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you that you are our moral authority. We would be lost if we didn't have one central perfect figure to look to for guidance in these things. We would be lost, Lord. We would not know how to respond. We would not know up from down, light from dark. We would just... We would just flounder. But you have given us everything we need for life and godliness, for glory and virtue. 
And so I pray, God, that you would be our moral authority in all things. May our feelings, may culture, may peer pressure, uh, may the preacher, uh, may our conscience, or whatever else might compete with you, Lord, may it be squashed in our minds and have no effect upon us, for we look to you as our moral guide. Lord, guide us, we pray. Guide us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper tonight. And uh, what a privilege it is to do that. And not only a privilege, but it is our duty. For the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. As she begins to play softly, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads again and just take a moment to pray and to prepare your hearts in coming before the table. If you were to come to somebody's home for dinner, you would go and you would wash up. You would make sure you're nice and clean. Well, we're coming to the Lord's table tonight, and we need to be very careful that we're coming, having examined ourselves. And so this would be the time to do that. So she's going to play softly for just a moment or two while, we, while I gather my thoughts and prepare and you take time now to consider what you've heard tonight and what you've heard this morning. And maybe God has put something else on your heart to deal with. You deal with that. I would encourage you, if somebody's here, that maybe uh, you don't have everything just right with, maybe quietly scoot over to them and make it right. Make it right. Now, they might not want to make it right. That's, that's up to them. That's all you can do. But the idea here is that we come to the Lord's table as clean as we can be. So she's going to take a moment. She's going to play. We're going to speak to the Lord. Mm -hmm. 